Lady Ada. Hey everybody and welcome to a cat filled desk of Lady Ada. Um, it's a cat shadow. I am uh, <laughs> I'm Lady Ada the engineer and with me is a uh, MOSFET. Hi I'm the cat leave me alone and also um, the floating head of Phil. Hi mm -hmm. floating head of Phil. Apparently the destructor. Destructor um, and uh, it's a quick check-in tonight because I've been like knee-deep in this um, this project, and I'm basically doing some HDMI decoder hacking. So I thought I would show how we do the reverse engineering for this. Me and K Town have been working on this on and off for the last like six months or so, and I've been kind of putting off this project for two years. So um, how about we go to the overhead? Yeah, let's do that. Okay, so this is this like really nice HDMI um, backpack that. I designed like a year ago ish, and um, okay, and um, this has HDMI input and is powered over micro USB, and this is really handy for when you just want like a little HDMI display. A lot of uh, single board computers these days, like Raspberry Pi and, and the Odroid and the um, Blueberry Pi and, and whatever, they all have HDMI output because HDMI is, is often built into the processor itself or the, the BeagleBone, the little converter chip to do so, but it's a very uh, common way to do video. And they, everyone got HDMI screens. So, you know, this is the replacement for VGA screens. What's really nice is that there's this chip from TI, the TFP401, 401A. And this chip, uh, it's kind of big, but what's really cool is that you have HDMI coming in and it will give you TTL RGB out. So this is like eight pins of red, eight pins of green, eight pins of blue, uh, V sync, H sync, data enable, and pixel clock. So it's a, literally just like every time there's a pixel to be drawn, it just toggles the data out and, and toggles the pixel. And uh, this display, these displays are very common. These uh, TTL RGB displays tend to go up to like, you know, 1,024 by 800 pixels or so. They're, they're good for smaller screens. And what's um, nice about this is very simple. Basically, you just give it HDMI input, and it gives you that TTL output. But there's there's one thing that frustrates me about this driver. It's for the most part really good, but it doesn't have a scaler, which means you can only display whatever resolution is on, of, you know, of the screen. So the screen here is 800 by 480 pixels. You can only output. 800 by 480 pixels like you can't scale 720p or 1080p it won't do that if you try to send 720p which would like you know extend beyond the screen what happens is you get a cut of the corner you only show the corner in the top the the driver is not smart it's just like whatever resolution data comes in i'll spit it out it doesn't know how to change the width and height to scale it to the side of the display which is like kind of sucky because it works for like 99% of things, but for the Raspberry Pi, you have to like manually tell it how big the resolution is and some other display. Sometimes it auto detects, Windows auto detects because it's got a really good uh, graphics driver, Mac auto detects, but other devices don't. So like, you know, we plug this into like a Canon camera, for example, with HDMI output, it doesn't scale the output. It like it cuts it off and it only shows like this portion because it doesn't. Again, it doesn't know how to scale the video. So this works pretty well. I mean, it's been popular. It's been a popular product. Um, it works quite well. Once you configure it, you get a very nice display. But yeah, no scaling. So we also carry in the shop um, these uh, HDMI driver boards. And can we uh, go to the compi and I'll, I'll show this show this off. So on Adafruit we have the um, <clears throat> HMI VGA driver board. So these like driver boards here, these are like, you know, very common driver boards. Uh, I buy them from a factory in China. They're, they're kind of mass manufactured. And they use the RTD2660H 
or 2662. And this chip is from Realtek, which just has the coolest logo. I mean, look at that. I mean, I need it's to a zoom. crab. I'm going to zoom in. I'm going to... So hold on, everybody. Okay. I got to zoom in on this. Stop the presses. I got to do some, some stuff, but it's going to be worth it. You'll all be happy. Well, one of you are, but what, most of you are. Oh, the one crab oh, no. that's watching? Hey, you're, oh, yeah, no, logo wait. Change. Nope. Man. Wrong logo. So no. All right. Crab. Okay, just, just wait. I'm waiting. Okay, I'm doing this. Wow. Okay. Okay, so there you go. It's, uh, it's the RTD, yeah, and they've got, they've got this crab. And this chip, what's neat is you can also, you can even see the HDMI signals come in here. This is where the HDMI signals come in. And it also has VGA output, so you can have, um, sorry, a VGA input. So you can see VGA coming in here. There's got, it's got some resistor dividers. So maybe it does analog. Maybe, you know, because, actually, I don't know what, I don't know exactly what this is. Maybe just to get the levels to the right um, size and shape. So you've got VGA input from this here, and then you also have composite input. So that's pretty cool. And then um, on the output, you've got a couple different options. You've got LVDS, or you have a, a, a TTL connector. And let's see if I can find the other one second. So this is RTD. No, it's one second. Right Micah just says, I had Micah. Hi, Micah. Yeah. Um, so this... Thanks for letting us play the video. Everyone really liked it. Yeah. Including people in the chat right now. <laughs> so the, this, um, this driver you see, it's connected to the 50-pin TTL connector. And um, let's see, I can zoom in a little bit. Whoa, wrong... Wrong zoom. One moment. Open link in new tab. Yeah, so you can get um, TTL output, VGA input, composite input. So this is like an all-in-one chip. But, of course, you can't get a data sheet. The data sheet is under NDA. And, like, I guess I could go and contact them and um, request the data sheet in, in exchange for, of course, you know, signing some document. But then I would almost certainly not be able to release schematics which or whatever firmware. I'd, I'd be stuck. You know, once I sign an NDA, you've reached an agreement with them. If you black box something or you reverse engineer it using all the information available publicly, then you're not bound by the NDA. I can release whatever documents or schematics. Yeah. So, and you know, what? one thing that happens to us is there seems to be a big spectrum. There's not a lot in between. Either um, folks want to work with us or um, we represent the scariest thing ever and they don't want to. Um, and that, that includes after um, we'll use a chip or something. So the salespeople are really aggressive, we'll buy one particular component that's good from their company, and then after that, if they don't have stuff that we think is useful, mm -hmm. um, we just say no to the meetings and that we're not interested, and they're like, but can't you just, can't you just do it? Can't you just do it? <laughs> and yeah, so, there's a little bit of that. And there's a lot of that. Um, so it's like, we have to be really careful if we sign an NDA, because we're giving up a lot. Mm -hmm. We're usually not gaining a lot. We're usually giving... It, it's, it's the opposite of what you, you'd expect for an NDA. Yeah. Like, oh, you're going to get all this information. No, it turns out the world isn't going to get right. as much information. And sometimes they're like, oh, we're going to give you an apps engineer. But, like, sometimes, sometimes not. So... Uh, we've been promised that every time for everything. And, there's a lot of promises. Yeah. Um, we, you know, we will sign NDAs when it makes sense. Yeah. And, but they're very time limited. Yeah. We usually demand to have an NDA last no longer than a month. Oh. Or only until with the release of the pump. Do you want to, yeah, you want to give a tip, a, a maker business tip? Okay, maker business tip. So we'll get rolled in because, like, at some point a marketer will be like, well, yeah, we're having a big launch in September at, like, Maker Fair in New York. Um, and we'd love to, you know, have you uh, do something with this product or whatever. And sometimes it's, it looks good. And we'll say, great. And they send an NDA and it's bound for five years. And even though they're, like... If, the event is in two months, even but... Even though it's yeah. voided anyways, yeah. like, after it's public and, and all that, it's a bi-directional NDA, we say, well, why don't you just put the date on there? Because, you know what, changes a lot between when they What sit. if they don't end up, you know, doing this project? Yeah. You don't want to get bound by a five-year yeah. NDA, so, so we don't. So what has happened in the past when right. I said that, it's like, oh, you're going to launch at a public date, it's going to be this time, and uh, so why don't you put that in there, like, well, you know, there's a good chance a deadline might slip. 
Wait, what? Like, you yeah. want us to do all this work for your deadline, and then you're saying it, it's not even going to happen. Right. Anyway, so if you're ever in a position um, to ask for an NDA to be a little bit more straight up, that's my make a business tip. Oh, the day. Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, so, okay, so you don't want to get the NDA for this, this chip, but um, you, know, you can Google around and you'll find some from data sheets, but the data sheets usually don't, like this chip in particular, and later on probably another video I'll go into depth about this chip, it has an 8051 processor inside that's programmed with some special software. So um, having the data sheets handy, but you have to match the schematic to the firmware. And like, if you know what I mean? Like the pins, some of the pin configurations like a GPIO or PWM, it isn't necessarily defined in the data sheet, it's defined by the firmware. So I thought, well, you know, let's look at a very simplified version of this chip. So this is a, basically the most basic breakout. This is a HDMI in to TTL 50 pin out. It's very basic. It's got, um, you know, the HDMI input, so it's nice, TTL output, and you can even sort of see like groups of pins. So it's like, you know, red and green and blue. And this pin, the pin out for the connector is very, well defined like these pins are very easy to reverse engineer because you're like okay well it's going to be red one red two red three green one green two eight bits blue and then um clock bit clock um v-sync clock h-sync and you know, data enable and sometimes there are a couple of pins other than that over here you can see there's clearly um linear voltage regulator it's a 3.3 and a 1.8 volt You've got this crystal here. Crystal even has the value on it. Lovely. You can tell it needs the 22 picofarad and a one mega ohm resistor to stabilize it. A um, couple simple passives. Uh, and then you can see here, this is the LED driver. So the LED backlights for all these displays are usually seven to eight LED strings. You need to have a constant current boost converter. That's what you got here. And then this is interesting, this chip here. So this chip, this eight, eight pin chip. What you'll see, especially for really low cost microcontrollers is um, they don't have flash on the chip itself. It's not unusual for microcontroller, like uh, A6 like, uh, processors that have a microcontroller base, they won't have flash inside. Instead what they'll do is they'll have the flash be external. So this is an eight pin SPI flash chip, and you can just look up the part number. It's a 25 LC something something. It's a one megabit SPI flash, and that's actually really good news because what this means is um, even if you don't know the programming interface for this, later on we, we did find some people had I bought a programmer and then somebody had reverse engineered it already, so that's all lovely. But at worst, if you need to reverse engineer this, um, the schematic, and you need to get that flash and you want to program your board, you can always get one of those SOIC clips, the little clip-ons, and you can just read this. It's SPI flash. So just read the SPI flash off. Very simple, well-documented. And then for the board that you're manufacturing, you SPI flash the other way. So it's like very simple. Like we, we've even done this for other chips, like the um, VLSI VS1000, which is an Og Vorbis slash wave uh, microcontroller plus DSP. The code is all the code and file system is stored on external SPI flash. So when we're in production, we there is a bootloader on the chip. We skip the bootloader and we just burn the chip directly to the SPI flash. So this is kind of looking good. Um, you know, it's not BGA, so that's nice, and it's kind of a big chip. Uh, some of these pins are really easy to reverse engineer. The, the TTL output, which is this whole section over here, basically one quarter of the chip is this side, very easy. You can see here, this is the SPI flash interface, HDMI in. But we want to actually do the full schematic capture of this. And again, there's some pinout information available in the data sheet, but that might not match up with the firmware that we're going to um, grab off of this chip so we want to make sure that the board that we make is one to one as close as possible with this one so here's what i did because we have we have you know you use the resources you have so the resources we have is hot air and good photography get a good photo studio so i pulled the chip off 
Because of course, you know, you have to see what's going on underneath. So you just hot air, remove the chip. And then, um, this is another picture. And then I also took a picture of the bottom. But I don't remember where it is. And then I combined them. So what you see here, let me expand this and then layers. That's not layers. What's not layers either? Layers? Layers. Okay. So what you do is you take the, the top photo and you paste it in. So this is the photo and I, and I kind of, um, I made it very contrasty. And you can see I kind of lost a couple pads here, but you can very nicely see all the traces. And then you paste the bottom of the board, just the photo of the bottom flipped around. And then what you do is you basically just mess with the skew, uh, not S-K-U, S-K-E-W, the skew and orientation to get them to match up. And then you just make the top layer 50% opacity. And now you can, for example, see this trace here. It's easy. It's like super easy now to see, oh, this trace connects this capacitor back to this pin. And then it goes underneath here and then traces around to this ferrite and over here to this capacitor you know it's, it's like it's not perfect like for example like I probably could have removed the HDMI connector because there's a couple of traces that I don't you know you, they disappear because I didn't um, uh, remove the chip so if you're really doing this the way you, you want to do it is keep the passives on because they're simple two pin connections and then remove all the connectors but in this case the HDMI pins you know I could just um, do a continuity test between this trace and these traces so I just figured it out with continuity and uh, yeah you can go through and then you can see um, all these pads underneath so it becomes pretty simple if you need to you can always remove the pin uh, the the component but you can see like okay this this trace over here where does it go to so this is kind of nice you can see like oh this probably goes to this trace here and this is the ground and then you know how did these go around over here and under here so that's kind of a a fun trick to do. There's, I think, um, Joe Grand tried to write an automated tool, or he wrote a, an automated tool that lets you do this, and there might be some tools that help you. But honestly, I, I find that I just do it pin by pin. And then when we reverse engineered it in K-Town, did a lot of this because he was very good at being precise. So let's see if I can pull it up. I think this was Rev A. Okay, so Rev A, we basically just kind of like try to duplicate all the components and get them into the same orientation and location. So this is that sort of saying like, hey, well, you know, let's get all of these parts as good as possible. And then I think by Rev B, we actually had it duplicated. And I tr tried to actually make it so it's the same size and location and all the components are named the same values. I did skip a couple of things. Like there's a, a backlight controller for an EL backlight and like I just skipped that part. Um, but otherwise we just tried to you know, duplicate all of the components as much as possible. And this isn't the final version, but like just figuring out if this is the correct schematic and layout. And then um, when we got this, I actually just swapped out this chip, the SOIC. I, I heat um, removed it from the working RTD driver to this one, and it booted up just fine. So, you know, turns out, you know, I had one or two pins that were missing that, um, like, automatically turning off the backlight with no HDMI signal, so I got that working in a later revision. But it's a, it's a really um, fun and useful trick for... Uh, avoiding having to pay for or you know uh, sign an NDA or or get an eval board where you're you're locked into some agreement with the vendor so this worked out pretty well and the next step is of course figuring out the firmware because uh, the default firmware is okay but what I really want to do is configure different size displays and you have to actually hard code the display so maybe next video or in a later video I'll show uh, compiling with Keel, which I've never done, I got a copy of Keel 51, and um, setting up the 
um, pixel sizes, the horizontal and vertical to use a, with a custom display and wiring it with a custom display. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, let's do uh, let's do a comment and a question. Yeah. Sure. Um, first up, thanks, Micah. Uh, there was a resource that Joe Grant did do, and I posted the link in the chat. Yeah. So. I didn't um, use it this time. I, I probably should have checked it out, but it was like it really wasn't that hard. Yeah, because right. once we removed the, the chip, we noticed, like, you know, the quarter of the pins were connected to the TTL. The HDMI pins were really obvious. And then the rest were, like, ground or power pins. Yeah. So it wasn't We don't have a tutorial on this, but too bad. Joe has presentations yeah, anymore. Yeah, so he check does. Out that link. And then the other uh, one is K-Ton over here videos. Yeah, he's been in some videos. He's on a different time zone, so it's always hard to coordinate. And then the last one is uh, how do you dissolve that goo, that black goo on the electronics on there? Oh, you know, I have I've not had to um, dissolve epoxy. But you'll probably just want to use some like really terrible solvent I feel like, to remove it. I feel like Bunny probably wrote about this somewhere. I mean, you would use it. To, the, it would you would dis dissolve it the same way you dissolve epoxy for decapping chips, which is um, I think yeah. hydrofluoric, but I don't recall. What I want to say use. that I don't know if it was. It's just horrible stuff. I don't know if it was in Hacking Xbox, but I think Bunny. I think he had something. Maybe. Did he decap some epoxy? I think so. Yeah. I mean the the epoxy that they use for um, bond like wire bonded chips directly on board is just I mean it's basically the same as whatever is packaged with chips. It's like the same material. Yeah. Usually people like actually grind it off. Acetone. Huh? Acetone. Acetone is not going to take that stuff no. off. Now you need something way more vile. I mean it's it's epoxy epoxy. Mm. It's basically ceramic. You know it's. It's tough stuff. And then once you dissolve it, you, you, you destroy the board usually. Mm. Okay. I think it's against our least. Hydrofluoric and fuming nitric for decapping. Yeah. So Milling machine. You can, you yeah. can mill it, but then you, know, you have to be careful not to Even damage the traces. Other mill. <laughs> Very slowly and carefully. Yeah. yeah, if you jig it really well, I mean, and if it's perfectly flat, you could just slowly slice off layers until you get to the board, but you know you won't get the chip. You'd, ha you'd destroy the chip because the chip isn't going to be perfectly flat. Okay, that's it. Okay. 22 minutes on the dot. Yeah, just a fun a fun little romp yeah, through good. this chip. This is actually, I've been meaning to get around to working with this chip for so long. It's been a year or two, and uh, finally sat down and, and just like, okay, I really, the, you know, all the new displays that are coming out, aren't stand you know they're they're all for cell phones so they're vertical not horizontal yeah. the portrait not landscape so i have to rewrite the firmware so i was like if i'm going to rewrite the firmware i should make it so that it's a custom board so i'm not stuck with this other board that doesn't even have the right connector on it mm. okay all right that's it okay rowdy okay everybody thanks everybody we'll be doing a video uh, tomorrow night yes all right later <laughs>